Welcome to Planet Sleep. I'm your host, Josh, and tonight we'll be traveling together to the mystical, swirling jungles in the rich lands of Cambodia. Before we go, I wanted to remind you that one way you can support the show for free is by making sure you're subscribed on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and following us on Spotify. It really does help the show out, and I personally really appreciate it. You took a moment to do those things before we continue. This episode of Planet Sleep is brought to you by Higher Love Wellness, my wellness and CBD brand. If you haven't checked out Higher Love Wellness before, we sell 100% THC-free CBD products made from Colorado-grown hemp, and we ship them to all 50 states, as well as several countries internationally. You can get 10% off your purchase of gummies, vapes, oils, or topicals with code PLANETSLEEP at checkout. This is a family owned and operated company, and I would most appreciate any support you can give. Before we start our trek into Cambodia, let's take a few moments to find somewhere to sit or lie down and center our mind, body, spirit for the journey ahead. Take a few deep breaths in through the nose, out through the mouth. Try to calm and relax the mind as the journey ahead is going to be hard and you need all the strength you can muster. Pay attention to your heart rate and try to slow your breathing down as much as you can. And just take a few moments to breathe in and out. Now that we're calm, relaxed, and ready to go, let's begin our journey to planet sleep. Mountains peak above swirling jungles in the rich lands of Cambodia. Sweltering heat moves through the trees below while the animals cool themselves in the pockets of natural rivers and man-made canals. The region is blessed with both wet and dry seasons. Like the balance of yin and yang, they complement each other. But when these seasons are unbalanced and the heat goes unchecked, the rivers dry up the animals perish. To keep a perfect balance, the rainforest needs to thrive, and the more of it we lose, the harsher the climate becomes. As you press on through dense jungle terrain and small clouds of bugs, your journey through Cambodia is unbearably hot. The sweltering temperatures and foggy humidity beat you down as you travel through muddy pathways. The endemic animals might be used to this heat, but you're not. Luckily, you're willing to fight through the heat to witness the incredible sights and sounds along your journey. Near the southern edge of Cambodia, you push through a dense jungle to reach an open clearing fog seems in the distance, and an oddly colored building stands ahead of you. Clearly abandoned, the building has slowly fallen apart. It's tainted by the water and vegetation. This abandoned fort was built by French soldiers in the early 1900s. And just like you, the French could barely stand the heat. As they occupied the land, they built this Bokor Hill station to try and escape the heat. Construction finished in the early 1920s and by the end of it, they had built a small city. It included a post office, 
a church, and a hotel. The hotel still stands as a monument to the French occupation of Cambodia, and it's an ugly sight. The station was abandoned in the 1940s, and as the war continued through the 20th century, the station was gutted and they left it behind. You find the last existing road to the station, a bumpy, ruined street that stretches 3,500 feet. Strange enough, the area is currently being refurbished by a private investment group. The locals call it an eyesore, and it's one more reminder of foreign invaders in Cambodia. But nature has taken back most, if not all, of the land. Fighting back against Mother Nature's work will take plenty of time and money. The gray walls of the buildings are stained red. Moss grows in every direction. And none of the glass windows have survived the test of time. Beyond the casino lies the Temple of the Five Ships where rock formations look like sailing ships in the foggy meadow, and an open view of the valley below gives you a refreshing feeling after traveling through the dense jungle. Further down the road is the waterfall in the clouds, where clear waters cascade down a series of rock formations. The sound of the waterfall is a constant rush of water against stone, like white noise for falling asleep. The water crawls down the rock sides and meets in a bronze pool below. The mist from the waterfall floats through the air and cools you down for a moment before continuing on. Along a back road sits rows and rows of rice fields between trees. Not far across the way, rare carnivorous plants find their homes in between groupings of trees. And this whole area feels like Cambodia in a nutshell. Old relics taken over by nature, unbearable heat, cooling waterfalls, and a jungle filled with rarities. And soon you find yourself back in the rainforest, trudging through the mud on jagged pathways. You head towards the heart of the jungle. As you work your way further into the thicket, you begin to feel isolated but peaceful. Trees and greenery stretch out in every direction you look. Other than the birds and insects that hum through the air, any trace of company is long gone. This central cardamom protected forest in southwestern Cambodia stretches 1,500 square miles. It's one of the most pristine forests left in the country and it's one of the last unfragmented rainforests left in Southeast Asia. Its rainfall supplies water to 22 major waterways in the region, and it powers 16 hydropower dams across the country, which provides around 20% of the country's electricity. As you walk along a narrow pass surrounded by an endless rainforest, you take in the fresh air. It carries a smell of spring, wet soil and blooming flora. Its trees crowd along snaking rivers and marshy swamps. You make sure to keep your journey towards the higher ground. As the lower you go, the muddier it gets. From these murky streams, the water flows into the Tonal Sap Lake, which provides drinking water for 30,000 people in the region. From these murky streams, the water flows into the Tonal Sap Lake, which provides drinking water for 30,000 people in the region. It connects with beautiful waterfalls that filter the water through layers of rock. And this water gives life to the natural surroundings of the forest. Nearly 450 bird species reside here, and more than 60 threatened plants and species live within its borders. Conservation groups have been hard at work protecting these lands since 2002. They not only protect the wildlife, but the health of the rainforest, 
which in turn gives life to everything in the region. Cambodian ancestors believe that the forest held a spirit called Nikti, so the locals wouldn't dare cut down the trees for fear of killing the angel within. They believe that the forest brought the nearby villages good fortune. The forest provides nutrients to the nearby lands and their rice fields rely on the health of the rainforest. As deforestation took away large areas of the rainforest, weather patterns changed and now rain doesn't fall as often. So the crops are now more difficult to grow. Even the ancient people of these lands knew that destroying the forest would make their lives more difficult. And so far they've been proven right. These rainforests are crucial to the surrounding ecosystems, as well as the survival of humans. So these forests need to be protected as if angels truly live within them. As you follow a jagged pathway through the dense trees, you meet with a small river curving along the damp soil. Just above the surface of the water, you spot the top of a furry animal popping up and down in the riverbed. It looks like a dog, but as it emerges from the river, you notice it's quite big for a dog. As it walks on all fours, its paws are turned inward, and it's about two feet tall. You second guess yourself, thinking that it might not be a dog at all. Seeing its round head, its big claws, and its flat nose, it must be a bear. It is, in fact, the sun bear, the smallest bear on earth. Ten times smaller than a polar bear, it almost looks like a big dog from far away. It's given the name Sun Bear because of its golden patch of fur on its chest surrounded by a jet black coat. The patch on its chest is an odd shape, and it almost looks like the insignia of a superhero. As the bear waddles along the damp soil, it finds the trunk of a nice tree. It buries its sharp curved claws in the bark and begins to climb. The bottom of its feet doesn't have any fur, and they have massive paws. This makes them exceptionally good climbers. High up the tree, it finds a nice perch up in the branches. The sun bear usually climbs anywhere between 7 and 23 feet in the air. It usually looks for a nice place to sleep or sunbathe, and they spend most of their time in the trees. Once it finds the perfect place, it lies down and hangs its arms off the edge. He needs to dry off after his nice swim in the water. So he lets the warm sun evaporate the water on his coat. As he yawns before taking a nap, his tongue stretches from his mouth. It's the longest tongue of any bear, even though they're the smallest bears in the world. Their tongues are over 12 inches long, which helps them eat. They also have the biggest brain compared to its body size in any other land carnivore. They're brilliant animals, which is crucial for their survival in the challenging rainforest. They need to be constantly on the hunt for their next meal, so they must continuously learn how to problem solve in the wild. They don't hibernate like their cousins because there usually isn't enough food, so they need to be resourceful in their environment. Luckily, their sense of smell is 2,000 times stronger than in humans, so they seek out their next meal with their noses, and once they find their food, they often have to reach, climb, or dig for their meal. And as they travel through the forest for food, they also help the forest survive. These sun bears are crucial for their ecosystems. They spread seeds, control pest populations, and cycle nutrients throughout the forest. Unfortunately, these unique bears are under threat because of deforestation and hunting. They have lost over 60% of their natural habitats, and their parts are sold on the black market. Young cubs are also sold alive as trophies, so conservation groups are keeping a close eye on the sun bear and its natural habitat. Thankfully, over the past two decades, sanctuaries have rescued hundreds of bears from the illegal wildlife trade, 
As you finish a short rest while leaning against a tree, the golden bear disappears somewhere high up in the leaves. Traveling along the path, you spot another rare animal in the Southeast Asian rainforest. It must be your lucky day. If the sun bear looks like a big dog from a distance, you also notice what looks like a big cat also hanging around the treetops. One of the most adorable leopards in the world clings tightly to a tree branch. Clouded leopards, also known as cloudies, can be found throughout Southeast Asia. Although it looks like a big cat compared to a common house cat, they only weigh up to 35 pounds, which is quite small for a wild leopard. Gently, the leopard stands up on the branch, showing off its beautiful coat. Clouded leopards get their names from the spots on their coat that look like clouds. Each patch of black fades into their beige fur. Unfortunately, they're hunted for this unique fur, as well as bones, claws, and feet. Only 10,000 clouded leopards are still left in the wild, and their numbers are dwindling. So you take a moment to appreciate getting to see one in the wild. Although they're cute, their fangs are massive. They're larger than any other feline teeth compared to their body size. This makes them the closest animal to the saber-toothed tiger. Their massive tail hangs to the side of a branch, and they use it to balance as they move from tree to tree. They also have rotating ankles which help them climb, and they can even climb sideways or upside down. They can also climb down trees head first if they need to chase after a small squirrel. If needed, they can also hang from branches with their hind legs like a bat. As you look around the forest, you don't see any other leopards around. They usually stick to their own territories, which are about three square miles in size. The leopard carefully washes its surroundings for any movement. Whatever moves might be its next meal. So you keep your distance and quietly head down the path. You also keep your distance from the rivers. Although you see nothing suspicious, hungry predators lie in wait. A fierce, scaly predator is known to inhabit these waters. The rare Siamese crocodiles of Cambodia have inspired legends of dragons. Found in the hidden waterways of the jungle, they lie low in the rivers and wait patiently. They were once hunted to near extinction for their hides, but they have survived the test of time. Some survive in captivity and local conservation groups help them survive into adulthood. Regardless, if you find them inside or outside of captivity, their temperament doesn't change. Although somewhat small, they're still feisty creatures. If you get too close, they won't hesitate to snap their jaws at the first sign of danger. Recently, a new population of these crocodiles have been discovered in the deep forests of Cambodia. Eggs have been recovered and the crocodiles are raised to adulthood inside sanctuaries before being released. They eventually return to the rivers of their native forests when they're fully grown. But their journey doesn't stop there. Conservationists ride motorbikes deep into the jungle and return these crocodiles. They carry them in makeshift cages made of plant fiber and they take them all the way to their natural habitat deep in the jungle. They hope that this species will return to the throne of these wetlands after being hunted to near extinction. They were once the kings of these jungles and maybe one day they will find their greatness again within the food chain. Here in these valleys near the Cardamom Mountains, the villagers regard these crocodiles as sacred creatures. They are most protected here so they are often released not far from the village. The locals believe that if one crocodile dies, misfortune will sweep through the nearby village, so they guard the crocodiles the best they can. Some can live up to 50 years, and females can lay 50 eggs a year. 
So these crocodiles might have a chance at thriving in these hot, wet forests if they're lucky. After avoiding the snapping crocodiles, you decide to take your hot and humid journey north, deep into Cambodia, until you reach the heart of the region. Between waterways, rice fields, and trees, an ancient city stands. The temple at its center is one of the hundreds that make up the Angkor World Heritage Site. In its prime, the city of Angkor was the largest city ever built before the Industrial Revolution. It's the size of modern-day Los Angeles. But in a short moment, the entire civilization mysteriously disappeared. Many believe a catastrophic event must have taken them out. Perhaps a plague, a drought, or an invasion might have been the cause. But the people that once lived here never kept historical records, so their disappearance is still a mystery. Within the tree rings of the vegetation, researchers have found evidence of a massive drought occurring near the disappearance of the Angkor people. But no one knows for sure. All that is left is the beautiful ancient ruins before you that cradle the trees. Gray rocks from detailed structures and many sit low to the ground, but the temples rise high in the sky. Each one signifies a deeper meaning of the ancient civilization that once roamed these lands. Ancient Angkor was the ancient city of the Khmer Empire. This military superpower ruled for six centuries in Southeast Asia. Much of modern day Cambodia was once the land of the Khmer Empire, also known as the Angkor Empire. In their popular origin story, an Indian priest sailed to Southeast Asia following an arrow he saw in a dream. After landing on an island, he conquered the land and he fell in love with a divine princess. The princess's father drank all the waters around the conquered island. And as the water receded, it revealed that the island was the top of a mountain. All of the lands that were uncovered became Cambodia. While the Indian priest and the divine princes lived in these lands, they had children. And these children became known as the Khmers. Each went on to rule the surrounding areas. Outside of folklore, the first inhabitants of the Cambodian land were most likely from southern China or northeast India, and they arrived to the area nearly 4,000 years ago. They brought with them the practice of cultivating rice. This area was also one of the first places in the world to use bronze. With this powerful technology, they would later give rise to the powerful Khmer Empire. The Khmer kings ruled the region for nearly 600 years from 802 to 1431 CE. The region sat perfectly between the trade route from India to China in a time when Buddhism and Hinduism rapidly spread. Through an early history of warfare and lands changing hands, the Khmer Empire began. Its kings were seen as gods who could communicate with the heavens. The early years of the empire were highly unstable. Civil wars and endless uprisings spread across the land. Many were unsuccessful and the empire eventually stabilized, and it soon became one of the most powerful empires in Southeast Asia. The plain of Angkor that surrounds you was once the place of seven cities. Each had its own temple at the center and they were all connected by canals. As the wealth spread and the cities grew, they eventually united to form one major metropolitan area. It was believed to have one million inhabitants at its peak. This made it the largest city in the world at the time. What's left is a plain of ancient ruins, and only your imagination can fill the gaps now. But the Khmer aren't entirely gone. Over 90% of Cambodia's population is Khmer people. And many cultural customs and traditions have been passed down through generations. 
Many descendants now work on maintaining their heritage by preserving the ancient cities and temples that are hundreds of years old. Temples, roads, and canals swerve through the jungles. The ingenious network of canals connects to major waterways. Many are dried up today, but traces of them still remain. The river that flows through today is actually the remains of an ancient canal, and it still flows the same as it did a thousand years ago. The waters gently curve along a river wide enough for a few small boats to pass through. Step beaches hug the shoreline and the green foliage crowds the edge of the beaches. At the center of this canal system, the water connects to a mile-long reservoir at the edge of the ancient city. It's estimated that this massive reservoir took 6,000 workers nearly six years to dig out by hand. But the reason behind the water is still a mystery. It was first believed that they redirected water for some spiritual reason for the temples. But after archaeologists looked closer at the stonework, the reservoir walls were engineered to sustain massive amounts of water. And many believe these systems were used to redirect water during the wet seasons. Cambodia only has two seasons, the wet season and the dry. These early civilizations had too much water for half the year and not enough water for the other half. So the secret to their success was storing rainwater in the reservoir during the rainy season. And when the dry season was upon them, they could use the stored water to grow crops. They would release the excess water and it flowed down the canals, giving life to the rice fields of the region. Nearly 30,000 square miles of rice paddies surround the area. You see these fields in the distance as a light fog moves through them. Their fields stretched to the ends of the earth, and their rice once supported the entire population of this ancient city. But this water system is only one of the many mysteries of this ancient city that has been uncovered. Many other mysteries still remain. During the same time as the European Renaissance, the ancient city of Angkor fell apart. Although it had the means to support its one million residents, something catastrophic must have happened. After their disappearance, the city's stone structures were swallowed by the surrounding jungles, and the entire civilization was lost. Today the traces of a 1,000-year-old road is still visible on the ground. Trees have overtaken many of the stone structures, but they still stand strong. Massive root systems hug the stone walls, covering the intricate designs and incredible architecture. Root systems weave between stones, breaking apart the walls. And now nature and these man-made structures live as one. Yet they don't live in harmony. The jungle has aggressively taken back the land, and some of the structures have been severely damaged. Over the centuries, the constant rain has slowly destroyed areas of the city. To the naked eye, it looks like the vegetation is the main culprit. But the true enemy of these structures is actually water. You look around corners and see modern reinforcements built around crumbling walls. Stone bricks have separated and have fallen to the ground. Rainwater sneaks through the bricks and shifts the ground where the bricks meet the earth. This has caused many structures to collapse. Without reinforcement, many of these structures would have been permanently lost. Luckily, many architects have worked together to repair and preserve the ancient city, and they have rebuilt sections of the city the same way the ancient workers did centuries ago. They were built by stacking a core of laterite bricks for the foundation. Then they encased the core in sandstone. Even though this is an ancient city, modern scaffolding and architects are often seen working at the site. But the repairs are so authentic that you might not notice the difference between a centuries-old stone and one that was placed yesterday. You make your way through a pathway of low grass, and you head towards the main temple. Between these ancient walls, their placement leads you towards the great temple ahead. Its peaks stand tall in the sky above. You notice nature has taken back much of the land, 
and at the peaks of the temple small seedlings grow. The nearby birds have dropped seeds on the rooftops, and as these seedlings grow, their root systems threaten the structure of the temple. These peaks can reach nearly 200 feet above the ground. You watch as a worker wearing a hard hat climbs up the side of the temple. He reaches for the seedling and pulls it from the deep crack in the stonework. The seedling is torn out so the ancient structure can survive. The closer you get to the temple, the etchings of ancient artwork appear on the surrounding stones. From far off, what looked like rugged stones were actually detailed depictions of ancient Hindu beliefs. Endless descriptions of cosmology and ancient battles cover the sides of the walls. Brick after brick, the artwork seems to last forever. It took nearly 300,000 workers nearly 40 years to complete this enormous temple. A mystical sensation washes over you as you realize the effort put into this building was one of a kind. The era where a temple like this could possibly be built is long gone, and you stand in awe as you try to wrap your head around the challenges this construction must have faced. And as you take a moment to appreciate the structures, you notice many other people stand around you, appreciating the same thing. Large crowds of people bustle in to see the ancient temple. And just as Mother Nature invaded the temples and took its toll, tourism has done the same. Thousands of people a day visit this sacred site. Although your presence isn't an issue, you watch as many of the visitors put their hands on the ancient walls to touch the artwork. Touching these walls will slowly destroy them. And this history will be slowly erased as more and more people touch these walls. So you make sure to keep your hands to yourself. You head into the temple and witness the height of the structure. The walls head straight up towards the peak where a mysterious opening sits at the very top. Built in the 9th century, many of these structures represent Hindu cosmology. Similar to the Mayans, the Khmer calendar reflected the cycles of the stars above. This ancient civilization studied the sky and noted the passage of time. Within the temple, twice a year a celestial event occurs. And this spectacular event is how the ancient kings demonstrated their divine right. When the sun is positioned directly over the temple, the sunlight sends a beam of light through the small opening. You watch as the beam first begins at a slight angle, but as time passes, the beam slowly shifts. It finally forms a perfect column of light from the top of the tower down to the pedestal resting on the floor. At this moment, the Khmer kings would stand on the stone pedestal and they would reach to the heavens and connect with their god. The kings believed they were the god kings and they would use their ability to command thousands of servants to build the city you see today. As time passed, the empire shifted to Buddhism and the kings were no longer seen as gods by the 13th century. They no longer built Hindu temples, but the structures remained. As you wander through the rest of the ruins, you understand that many of these ancient civilizations were inspired by the dedication to their faith. For your last stop before sundown, you head to the region of Badam Bang. Through the endless rice fields and small rural villages, you reach a series of caves near. This area is known for the Killing Caves, a memorial to the 1.7 million Cambodians killed during the Cambodian genocide between 1975 and 1979. Although sobering, the caves are quite beautiful. The surrounding nature adds a peaceful aspect to the memorial. The rocks are covered in greenery and low-hanging vines and the air is still and quiet. You try to match the quietness of your surroundings and pay respect to those who lost their lives. After a moment of silence, you take your leave. Just down the road, you gather with a group of visitors at dusk. 
The sun begins its descent behind the distant hills, and you notice the visitors wait patiently as if something miraculous is about to happen. You head to a hidden path that takes you to the mouth of a great cave, and you wait for the sun to finally disappear. The harsh light fades, and all that is left is the orange sky of dusk that covers the tops of trees below. And as soon as it's dark enough, a raging sound of flapping wings echoes from within the cave. It builds and builds until the sound reaches the mouth of the cave, and as you take one short breath, a burst of black bats explodes from the mouth of the cave. A black cloud of flying creatures fill the sky, and their silhouettes chase across the last bit of daylight. There are so many bats, it takes nearly 20 minutes for them to evacuate the cave. By the time they're all out, massive clouds move across the sky as the bats scoop up tiny insects in the air. The clouds churn and wave as the group moves in a strange harmony. You take a seat on a nearby rock to watch the clouds of bats fade into the distance. As the evening sky slowly moves towards darkness, your day is through. You set your back against a soft rock wall and look out at the scenery. The green trees turn to orange in the dusk light, and now they fade to black as you close your eyes. The heat of the sun subsides as the bright yellow globe entirely disappears behind the horizon, and you rest for a moment, taking in the chirp of crickets and bugs, lucky enough to evade the horde of bats. They go on to live another day in the beautiful countryside of Cambodia, and your dreams are filled with god kings, cosmic beams of light raining down from temple ceilings, and the memory of ancient ruins, all before Mother Nature takes them back. That concludes our journey to Planet Sleep for tonight. I hope you enjoyed this most interesting and beautiful trek through the truly magical country of Cambodia. If you enjoyed Planet Sleep, be sure to let us know in the comments below. Maybe let us know where you'd like to see us take Planet Sleep next. I've been your host, Josh. And I hope that this podcast has provided you some relief from the stresses of the day. And hopefully, if you're listening as you go to bed, I hope it sends you into a peaceful slumber in which you wake up feeling refreshed and ready for the day. I'll see you next time in our journey to planet sleep. But until then, sleep easy, my friend.